Good morning, February 26, 2022. God has blessed us to see another day. It's so beautiful here in my neck of the woods because we got everybody from all over the country. It is a sunny day here in New York City. We welcome you to the international, sorry, interfaith action movement. I am here. We're going to talk about trauma and mental health. We are international. That's true. We also interfaith. That's true. We have a lot of action. That is true. And we are moving in the right trajectory. So we have a wonderful program for you today with experts on trauma in the African-American community, on mental health in the African-American uh, community. I am your host today, your co-host, the Gary Graham. I was here last week talking about domestic violence. My contract got extended one more week. Thank God for the Reverend Derek Love Green. I can do that because that's my uh, partner from 30 years ago. And uh, we are on a mission for uh, God and Christ to do better. Big shout out to the I Am uh, movement, uh, the prayer line that was there this morning. Big shout out to uh, Pastor Trey. Uh, my friend, uh, Pastor Johnson. So um, I'm going to bring up Reverend uh, Green in a hot second. We thank you for um, coming on today and make it a very successful um, engagement last week. And we're looking to uh, follow uh, that up. I want to introduce everybody to this super producer who uh, is producing this program. First, Dr. Phil, then I'm going to flip over to Reverend Green. And Dr. Phil and I will just uh, give everybody some ground rules as uh, we come in in here and uh, we talk about our, our session today. Dr. Phil, um, how are you today? Hope all is well. All Thank is you. well. Yeah, I know you're coming from Rhode Island today that we yes. don't stop. That's as, right. Uh, as Puffy said, we do not stop. Um, <laughs> I know you went away on vacation. We talk about uh, mental health. You renewed and you were recharged. That's right. um, you were doing some work behind the scenes. So we thank God that uh, you're doing it. Um, could you tell the people about saying what they need to say in the chat and uh, flowing with us while we do this uh, presentation today? Absolutely. Listen, this is all about mental health, trauma, African-American community. We want you to participate. So if you have any questions, we have some experts on this today. We're all about making the impact. We want to make an impact in your life. We want to make an impact and add value to our community. This Black History Month, this last weekend of Black History Month, we want to address some of the issues that are important to our community. So uh, this is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And we just want to say good morning, and thank you so much for being a part of this. Um, as I said, we'd love for you to share this video out. We'd love for you to like and subscribe. So wherever you're watching this, we'd love for you to share this out. We have important information we will be sharing throughout the broadcast. But at this point, we'd love for you to, if you're on Facebook, share the video. You're on YouTube. You can share this video through your phone. You can share it to your Facebook page. You can share it to your LinkedIn page. Uh, we would just love for you to share this out because we want to make the impact in our community. Well, thank you, Dr. Phil. And uh, anybody, if you want to have Dr. Phil come to your church or congregation, he's very modest. Uh, he's great behind the scenes, but he's a great speaker. Uh, he has his new book out with his new start initiative. His wife, yes, and uh, you know, uh, me and Reverend Green, we want that shirt that says don't quit and do it. So uh, we're looking forward to uh, having that. And we thank you for uh, working with us and welcome back from uh, sunny Belize. And so I'm glad oh, yeah. that you're here to work with us. So thank yeah. you so much. Belize is, is, is awesome. Okay. All right. And I found out that, you know, my family from Honduras is also connected to Belize, connected to Jamaica. I mean, so many connections mm -hmm. I found out this week. So. It's yes. been a great thing. All right. So thank you, you for checking out the book. Everybody, mm -hmm. it's a free download. Right. Uh, drphil2.com backslash ebook. Free book. 
uh, free ebook, Six Ways to Shape Your New Start. And coming to this subject, we want to shape somebody's new start. Good. Exactly. Well, go ahead and throw it in the chat like we're going to throw everything in the chat to verify. It's good to see you. Have a wonderful uh, Sabbath and a wonderful day of rest. And um, thank you for uh, working with us before we move on with our day. So I'm going to move on to uh, one of my favorite people in the world, uh, Reverend uh, Derek Green. Uh, he's going to join us to kick us off in uh, this uh, section, and we're very happy to work with him. And uh, he's gonna share our vision and moving in this trajectory. Reverend Green, how are you? How's everything going? Uh, looking good, my brother, all the time. What's going on? How are you doing today? Gary, yeah, great to be brother. Um, uh, and it's great to be here. Um, I just want to first uh, give honor to God, number one, for waking us up this morning. And, you know, during this pandemic, you can't take that for granted. And so we, That's right. we want to first thank God for waking us up this morning. Second thing we want to do is I want to uh, thank God for the interfaith action movement. I am. Yes, sir. And, um, and also our worship leaders, uh, Reverend Aisha Marable and Trustee Brenda Lee, Reverend Dr. Uh, Dorothy um, Stapleton and I'm um, Deborah Stapleton and uh, Pastor Mike and Reverend Dr. Dorothy Patterson. Um, and we just thank God for all those that are involved in I am and uh, uh, and Miss Irene as well, who is who is behind the scenes making a lot yes. of this happen. And yes. um, we, we want to thank all of I am and our mission is to address the spiritual, social, and economic needs of underserved and marginalized communities throughout the state, nation, and the globe. And we are doing just that. We started, uh, as I said last week, we started two years ago at wow. the beginning of the pandemic um, yep. in March. And we are mm -hmm. celebrating two years. Um, we just started as, uh, as a prayer call and mm -hmm. um, uh, someone called me, a uh, man by the name of uh, Reverend Raymond Fawale, uh, gave me a call and said, mm -hmm. Reverend Green, we must pray. And God spoke to me immediately and said, start a prayer call at the beginning of this pandemic. I, at that time, I was senior advisor to Governor Phil Murphy of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And we had something called the Faith Leaders Roundtable. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Gary, uh, I called a few folks, they called a few folks, and they called a few folks. And before you know it, we had a statewide group of people right. that meet every day. Mm -hmm. Daily. Daily. Right. Seven, days, seven days per week. And right. we haven't stopped. Right. Uh, we haven't stopped. And so, um, and the first half of the call is prayer. The second mm -hmm. half is activism and, right. and social advocacy. Mm -hmm. um, and, we, and we are really proud of what we've been able to, God has allowed us to be able to do. Um, God put into my spirit a few weeks ago, I talked to I Am about this issue of mental health in the mm -hmm. black community. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very serious issue. It always mm -hmm. has. Mm -hmm. And it's really something that we don't talk about. Mm -hmm. and, and we've been talking in I Am um because we are we are also a think tank as well yes mm -hmm. um with, with with folks like our resident historian uh dr stephanie james harris who's who's one of our guests we've been talking about systemic and personal trauma and it's something very unique to to african-american community and um and then we in today we see the debate going on between um and governor DeSantis and and, and, and the far right Republicans, or I call them Trumplicans, um, debating and using the critical race theory to separate people. Mm -mm. The critical race theory is about empowering people. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the book of James, and you talk, and, you, and James talks about trials and, and making it through trials and getting them through trials and considering it a joy, Gary, when trials come. There, there have been no community more impacted than trials than black yeah. people that came from Africa. Exactly. Um, and, 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 and so um, we've been able to persevere. 
mm -hmm. been able to be resilient. And so the mm -hmm. story of African-American history is not just about the names we call out, but is about how they persevered, how they were able to be resilient uh, mm -hmm. in the midst of of, of of chaos in the midst of in the midst of slavery in the midst of families being separate and 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 so instead of locking us out of history we need to be integrated into history so yes. that people will be able to make it when they go through because yes. no matter what color you are no yes. matter what height you are no matter how yes. you look no matter uh, uh, who you are, you're going to go through. Yes. And the story of the African-American experience in America mm -hmm. is a story of perseverance and it's a story of resilience. And then I'm going to say this. In Matthew 24, Gary, mm -hmm. it talks about um, the signs of the, uh, the end time. Yes. Yes, right? it does. Mm -hmm. So... And, and and I and I greet everybody, and I am every Saturday in my religious tradition. With, right? And in my church, we talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so, the disciples ask Jesus, you know, when when will this happen? How 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 are we going to know? Give me give me some signs, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus said, "Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and will deceive many." It says, folks that are listening, in verse 6, you will hear of wars and rumors. Rumors of war. Of war. Yes. Ah, but see yes. to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation mm -hmm. will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will mm -hmm. be famines and earthquakes in various places. And all these are the beginning of birth pains. Beginning yes. of sorrows, another another translation said. So, Gary, how does all of that that play on our mental health? Mm -hmm. We we've been talking about those things in our church for years, right? We've been talking about those things uh, in different uh, uh, churches and religions about about the, that Matthew verse. But how does that impact when we see mm -hmm. wars and we get anxiety and we get anxious and we get fearful and 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 we don't know the future. How do mm. people deal with with these types of traumatic situations? The pandemic, you know, crime is up. There's a reason why people are are committing suicide. And I, yes. I want to dedicate I want to dedicate um, uh, this show to yes. my best friends in life, Sean mm -hmm. Granville Crockwell, mm -hmm. um, who introduced me actually uh, to my wife. Years mm -hmm. ago at Oakwood University, I was and, there. And you, I saw yes, the whole thing. I saw the whole thing go down. <laughs> and Sean, mm -hmm. you would have thought that he was on top, top of the world. Uh, he was leading in his country. He was successful lawyer in Bermuda. Sean and I were together literally two weeks before he was found hanging in his closet. Mm -hmm. Then we were supposed to meet Saturday that he committed suicide. Mm. We were supposed to meet that Sunday, Gary, mm. in New York. And I played it over and over and over again in my head. Did I miss something? Mm -hmm. But he was obviously going through something that was an internal conflict that was in direct contradiction to the external. And so today we have, uh, we have guests on Gary, as you know, that are leaders in this field. Dr. Stephanie James Harris is going to talk about the historic context of mental health in our community. Thing that she's gonna touch on that most people don't know about and it's called Seasoning, and I used to teach this when I was at WAU, Washington Adventist University. Seasoning was a practice that the overseers in the Caribbean, when the Africans were brought from the west coast of uh, uh, from west coast of Africa, and they were spread throughout the diaspora, um, they would do something called seasoning. Doctor Stevens going to hit this right. Mm -hmm. Seasoning is 
the practice of intentionally separating both physically and emotionally from Africa. Mm -hmm. And and there were there was intense mental health issues that came about because of that practice, because of the slave trade, because mm -hmm. of plantation that followed us throughout until today, mm. until today. And so Dr. Stephanie James Harris is going to she is our resident historian, the executive director of the state's Amistad Commission, where in New Jersey, Gary, we mm -hmm. celebrate African American history. Learning we, all year, or learning all year round. All year, all year, all year yeah, round. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't start that. that. Don't start that anti-critical race theory here, because you no. get shut down. You get shut down in Jersey. No, not even shut down. Don't don't bring that here. Yeah, don't bring that yeah, here. Uh, who was our favorite player back in college? Like Patrick Ewing and yes. uh, Mutombo? No, yes. no, no. Well, no, 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 <laughs> no. None of that. That. Yeah. Hey, Gary, let me just say this. I, mm. I thank God for you, <laughs> uh, and your and your expertise. Thank you, man. Um, we are friends from college, mm. uh, and and I respect um, all that you do in this space. Thank in you, man. reference to trauma and mental health mm. and public health. You yeah. are one of our leaders, and we love you, and we appreciate you, brother. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, well, D, you, uh, Reverend D, uh, Derek, um, I'm glad that we can put it all together. I am ready to lift off. Um, I know you how passionate you about this. If anybody wants this to continue to happen, talk, talk to Reverend Green about this. And we'll keep it moving because we're very oh, serious. One more thing. One more yeah. thing on that. One more thing. There's something that God put into my spirit a couple of weeks ago. And I sent a text to my kids who are now 25, 23, and 18. Mm -hmm. um, and you knew them when they were babies. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's something going on as well mm -hmm. in reference to the messages and the images that they are hearing and seeing. Mm -hmm. Um a lot of young people, teenagers now, are committing suicide. Yes. They're committing and, suicide. Go ahead, yes. Yeah, and, and nobody's reporting it. That's right. That's Especially right. in the Black community. And it's That's just right. like nothing is happening. That's right. So, That's right. yeah, you're absolutely right about that. And I'm sure uh, Sister Lim Mills Chapman will talk about that, how trauma leads to suicide. And our kids are becoming invisible. Yes. A and uh, we need to stop that before it starts. Well, you ready to rock and roll with me? I'm going to pull you in and out. We're going to uh, have our, our audience meet some of these wonderful uh, people. Uh, I, see them behind the, I see them behind the scene. So just primp yourself just a little bit before I call you out. We're going to have a good time. But I'm going to start out, uh, uh, Derek, we're going to go around the horn. Uh, and we're going to bring people up and we're going to introduce them. And then after we introduce them, we're going to uh, get moving uh, on uh, this subject. So if you're ready mm -hmm. to go, um, Elder Stoddard, uh, if you can uh, come in through the back room, that's fine. We see you, brother. We can't wait to have you here. But I'm going to start with our good friend from Michigan, uh, Leah Mills Chapman, expert in trauma. Uh, and uh, she's going to introduce herself with Intervene uh, from Detroit, Michigan, where Jawan Howard was from with the big claw. Y'all saw what happened this week. And, and, and you and I talked about that. That, that, right. was, that was bigger than it was. Yes. That was bigger yes. than it was. Yes. The fact that you're not going to hold a brother and hold him by his shoulder. And uh, you're not going to get a, you know, a pushback from that. Those days are gone. So, um, and trauma for all these years are manifested yeah. in every way. So let's pull Leah up and Leah, could you please introduce yourself? Tell the family all about you and uh, we're glad to have you here. Good morning, everyone. Um, as stated, my name is Leah Mills Chapman. I am a clinical therapist with a specialization in the area of trauma. I tend often to work with, as we would know, or as they are called, marginalized populations. And so my focus is looking at the African-American community um, and intergenerational trauma. 
Um, as Gary stated, I am from the Michigan area, actually a small little city outside of Detroit, but we still claim it. Um, I am a two-time graduate of the University of Michigan. Go blue to all of my people out there that's listening. Um, and so, as, as again, I am the CEO of Intervene LLC, where I perform my personal practice there and work along with our people. And so I'm so grateful for this opportunity to be a guest on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for that, Leah. Uh, so I know you're not in uh, blue country, yet you're in another part of the country. And uh, thank you for joining us with uh, talking about trauma. We're going to come back to you. I'm going to circle down. I want to introduce to everybody. Spoke to her late last night. Wonderful woman, uh, Dr. Stephanie James Harris. Uh, come on board. Introduce yourself. Let everybody, everybody know, know who, who you are, are and, and we're glad that, glad you're, that here, you're here, here, here today. today. You on mute. You on mute. You're not. You're not. Okay. Okay. I'm going to come, I'm back, gonna come to back to you. If that's okay. I will bring up uh, Dr. Colette Barrow. Uh, please introduce yourself. Thank you for coming and joining us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Colette uh, Michelle Barrow. I am a member of Interfaith Action Movement, and so it's my honor to be on today. I'm in my professional life. I'm executive director of community and population health at University Hospital, um, located right in the heart of Newark, New Jersey. Um, in that role, um, there are a number of programs and initiatives that are underneath my belt that all serve um, the community of Newark and the greater um, greater Newark area. And so, um, and so when we talk about trauma, when we talk about wellness, um, all of our programs are addressing the needs of patients. Uh, we're talking about individuals that are living in impoverished areas, many of them are living in impoverished areas and even the trauma that comes along with that. And so we have a couple of programs where they're, um, is therapeutic case management. And so we'll talk a little bit uh, about that later on. But in addition to that, I'm also a part-time lecturer at Rutgers, New Brunswick for the Blouston oh. School, from which okay. I am a proud uh, alum. <laughs> yeah. I got my PhD from the Blouston, uh, Edward J, let me say it right, Edward J. Mm -hmm. Blouston School of mm -hmm. Planning and Public Policy. And mm -hmm. then I'm also um, founder and lead of Daybreak Women uh, Ministry, um, the name is Daybreak Women, so it's a ministry for women. Um, uh, but it's funny because recently we've been talking about matters of the heart. We've been talking about soul care and dealing with those issues soul uh, care. in our life. Yeah, dealing okay. with those issues in our lives that we have not dealt with yet. And much of that is trauma. And so I'm excited to be a part of today's platform. Well, thank you for coming on. And uh, we look forward to hearing some of your uh, expertise uh, on uh, trauma. And that's what we're here for. I am going to come back to my lady, uh, Dr. Stephanie James. I don't know if she is ready, ready yet. yet. Give me, Give the, me thumbs the thumbs up. up. Not. Not. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Sir. Don't worry about that. Let me go to my, my, my friend, Dr. Stoddard. Why don't sir. we come on up here? Brother, how are you? I am so sorry. <laughs> we talked a couple of days ago. Uh, Dr. Stoddard from the Church of the Oranges um, over there in uh, Jersey. I know your uh, pastoral people on your pastoral staff. I have worked with them. Please introduce yourself to everybody. We've been waiting for you to come on. Well, let me say good morning uh, to everybody. Man, it's good to see you. It's great mm -hmm. to see you. Great to be with uh Reverend Green, Elder Green, my friend, my brother from way, 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 way back. And mm -hmm. uh, what, a, what a great fellowship this is. Uh, I have the privilege, the opportunity of pastoring the Church of the Oranges uh, here in Orange, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. A wonderful church. We are yes. very much on the front line of meeting some of the challenges of our community. Uh, in addition to that, I serve uh, as a community health care chaplain down at UH and uh, work closely with Dr. Barrow. And so mm -hmm. it's my it's my pleasure to be with her this morning on board uh, on this program. And we deal with 
we deal with the disenfranchised, the marginalized, the people who are out there who desperately need a helping hand and need a, a, a help up and help mm -hmm. out. Yes. And so, you know, to be a pastor is one thing. You mm -hmm. have your congregation, you're dealing with the people that you know, there's mm -hmm. a certain comfort zone in being a pastor. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're assigned to this church for a period of time. You get to develop these wonderful relationships with people. Mm -hmm. and, and that's great. A community healthcare chaplain is dealing with the community on a mm -hmm. completely different, different. level yes. altogether. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, it's a privilege to come from the confines of the church setting, Come mm -hmm. from come from behind the pulpit, behind my my wonderful office and mm -hmm. <laughs> with, with excellent decor, mm -hmm. and get down to the grassroots, dealing with mm -hmm. the people. You know, the people that we often, when we're driving by and we have the stoplight, and mm -hmm. they come with the can and they say, "Can I get a dollar to buy some right. food?" And we push the window up because mm -hmm. we're tired of dealing with it. Mm -hmm. These are the people that I have mm. the privilege of working with and Mercy. serving. Thank God. And it takes a different mindset. Mm -hmm. It takes a heart to mm -hmm. actually see these people, love these people. Mm -hmm. And here's the key right here, to be reminded that this is a human being. Yeah. Thank you. And that's, that's, You're a, right. that's saying a mouthful. Yeah. That's yep. saying a mouthful because mm -hmm. if we're not careful, because we are used to dealing with a certain kind and a certain caliber of people in the church, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, many times we forget that this right here, mm -hmm. drug addicted, mm -hmm. uh, uh, homeless, mm -hmm. smelly, mm. this is a human being with a story. Mm -hmm. And I'm reminded day by day, there go I were it not but for, but the, for the grace, grace of, of Almighty God. God. You're right about that. And so yes. I approach it with a with a different with a different heart. And what a privilege it is. Sometimes I'm at the point of tears as I pray with people, mm. as I minister to people. Sometimes I, I'm at the point of tears as I hear mm. them crying on the other line mm. uh, and realize the trauma that they have been through the multiple layers and levels of trauma that they have been through uh, throughout their lives. And to hear their stories is an amazing thing and to be able to do something to lift them. What a privilege, mm. what a privilege. And so uh, I I'm looking forward to the discussion down the road on the line today. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Stoddard. We really appreciate it uh, for coming on today. Love you, heard all about your work. And, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try, try to get to get, to get Dr. Dr. Stephanie, Stephanie James, James Harris. Harris. Got you? Got you? I think so. Can you hear me? Okay. okay. I can hear I can you. Hear you. Loud and clear. Thank you. Okay. Don't like I, don't like echo, echo, but, do you have an echo? Don't, 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 don't worry about that. that. I'm going to let, let, let you introduce, introduce yourself. yourself. I'm not going to talk. And then we'll, and then we'll, we'll figure, we'll figure it, out. it out. Got it. Go right ahead. Then we know that there's something powerful that needs to be said anytime the devil starts messing with you before you even open your mouth. So I'm Dr. Stephanie James Harris. Good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to be able to be with you today. Um, I'm a historian. I'm the executive director of the Afro of the um, Amistad Commission. Um, my specialization is in African American history and content and educational policy. And the state of New Jersey, as Reverend Green did say, has been very intentional about making sure that the narratives in the history of African American people are not discluded, but and uh, are not discluded from the K through 12 curricula, but that uh, they are intrinsically included and are not allowed to be siloed because we are a part of the American story. Our personal experiences, our lived experiences have had huge com um, contributions to this nation and have shaped it. And there is no way to disjoint them from any student being able to understand who we have been. Um, so my job is to be able to kind of chronicle them for not only students and really looking at school districts, but also on making um, teachers very aware of their blind spots on the you know, cultural competencies, on cultural empathies, and just to make sure that the voices of our ancestors are always, always reflected when we're beginning to, to think about even our current lived situations. 
Thank you for Thank that. You for that. I, appreciate I appreciate that. that. I'm going to start gonna... with the first question. The Amistad revolution is in New Jersey. I'm going to start out uh, with Dr. Collette, um, and we're going to go around the horn, and I'll pull up uh, some people. Uh, in your estimation, team, and we'll go about it. I'll ask Dr. Collette, and I'll bring up Leah. Uh, what, in your, uh, what is the face to you of mental health these days? We don't want any PhDs answers. I want that gut reaction because we want to have that conversation that we have around a dinner table. You over my house now, I got some oxtails, I got some rice and peas right now, and I lean over to you right now and I say, Doc, what is the face of mental health? So good, so good. The face of mental health is you and I. Um, <laughs> girl, stop! You already start. It's already. it's right. it's the two of. I mean, it's 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 all of us, right? right. Whether it's whether you're you're working in a a, a high level job, mm -hmm. whether you're working in a low wage job, whether mm -hmm. you're a parent, a student, a grandparent, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. all of us. That is the face, really. I think of uh, mental health. Mm -hmm. All right. Leah, what you what what do you think is the face of mental health? Why don't you chime in there? So Gary, I'm gonna take it in a whole different direction. All right, all right. The face of mental health is the white man. Mm, okay. Okay. Right. So right. when we're looking at situations that happen that are egregious and harmful to all people, mm -hmm. the face of mental health is the white man because that's the pardon that's given. And mm. the actions that are actually exemplified are not called by its rightful name. It mm. is, oh, it was mental health. And that is an mm. allowance that isn't given to black people, right? Mm. When we look at our mental health, it is more along the, the lines of being insane. There was a time where our mental health was categorized in a way that did not allow for. Yes, yes. Right? So that's what I see as the face of mental health. And we're trying, right, to come along on that trajectory and assist our people in understanding that their minds matter as well. Man, uh, Leah, uh, Leah, I just, I just saw, saw uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Stephanie, Stephanie was, was not, not in her head behind, behind here. here. So I'm going to let her come and say, say something. something. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, you know, when I was trying to think about my answer for that, and I was actually, I was like, I don't want to answer your question directly because I actually have an inverse answer. I think the reality is, is that the face of mental health, although it should be ours, mm -hmm. we, we've, been in, we've been erased from being apportioned of that conversation. And so we're actually the erasure of acting as though we have the presence of mental health. And I think historically that has been the issue. You know, we are we are just now beginning to understand, not not quite not I won't say understand. We are just now being able to recognize for African American people, for African diaspora people, yes. the yes. post slave syndromes and the adaptiveness and the uh, you know the um, residuals, generational residuals and the adaptive behaviors are adaptive responses that are a part of generational trauma. And yet we are still not giving each other the grace to be able to move through it. And so, you know, we, although we understand it, we don't, we, we've not been not knowledgeable about it to be able to move through it in real time. Um, and so, you know, we still are not making, we're not making those assessments in the moment when we're seeing the reactions of others. And it has been such a taboo in regards of the spirit of how we got over, right? That is our story, right? Um, how we got over, as opposed to even being able to rest and say that we might not have healed, we might have gotten over. And so the healing process has got to happen for us to really be able to rectify where those things have sat in our behaviors, but also in what we are passing down generation by generation to our children because we because we haven't healed it we keep passing it down and because we're still in it it's it's not helping us really be able to to recognize it thank you thank doc. you doc uh dr, uh, dr. Stoddard, Stoddard, you put a bow on, on this question 
I'm going to come out. I'm having some feedback, but please, could you follow up on, uh, thank you, Phil, for that. Could you follow up on what the ladies have said? We say the face is us. Uh, Leah talked about the white man, and let's not be afraid <laughs> to say that. And what I got out of uh, what uh, uh, last doctor has said, um, she said, the getting over, and we have not healed. So I agree with all of that. Uh, could you uh, put some um, butter or some cream in my milk, where in my coffee, where that is concerned? <laughs> well, I'm, re I'm reading this book called The Body Keeps the Score. Mm -hmm. And when you asked the question, I immediately thought about the picture of the dogs. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in, in that book, the, the author talks about an experiment that was done with two sets of dogs. Uh, and one set of dogs uh, were placed in a cage and they were electrocuted. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were kept, when, when they were first electrocuted, they tried to get out. They hit mm -hmm. them against the cage and tried to get out. Uh, but after a while, uh, they kept electrocuting these dogs over a period of time. And after a while, they became immobilized. Mm. They stayed in their space and they mm. defecated on themselves. They just were immobilized. <clears throat> mm. They brought another set of dogs and put them in a cage and, and shot them. Uh, and they opened the doors of the cage of the dogs that were just shot. And those dogs ran out immediately. Mm. The dogs that had been shocked over a period of time, they opened the doors of the cage and shocked them again. Didn't and move. they did not move. But move. Mm. And so the author talks about what happens with trauma that mm. is sustained. Mm. And the, you know, as a pastor, sometimes I've wondered, why is it that this woman is in an abusive relationship and she just won't leave? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I read this experiment, it blew my mind because I'm thinking, get out, go. Mm -hmm. You have the power of choice. But sometimes sustained trauma immobilizes that person. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Get up and go. God gives you the strength. Get up and go. But sometimes you have to literally get into a situation and actually drag the person out. And what happened in this case with the dogs, for the dogs to get out to drag of the them cage, out. the dogs who had been shot, they literally had to go into the cage and pull them out. Because although the, the gate was open and they literally could have walked out, they had become so used mm. to that environment. They had become mm. so demoralized, debilitated. The cortisol level was in mm. such a state that although the door was open, they could not move. And I Thank thought you. to myself, my God, mm. how many of our people are like that? Mm -hmm. How many of our people have experienced su su such sustained trauma that they are mm. literally immobilized? They mm. can't get out. And we're sitting, we're sitting on the outside going, man, if I were you, I'd just get right. up and walk out. Right. It's like right. it's like it's like many of us, you know, many of us have said of the slaves, man, if I was a slave back in the day, I'd get man out of man. But sustained trauma is an awful thing that literally alters the brain. Mm. Let me uh thank you for this because that leads into my next question, uh, Dr. Barrow. Um, do you think our community, because you said the face was us, do you think our community takes mental health seriously. I know we do, but you do you think the overall community takes uh, mental health seriously? Thank you for that, um, that question. So the mm. reason why I answered um, by saying us, because when I think about mental, when I say the face of mental health, I'm talking about those who are suffering in that particular area. And the reason why I use suffering is because I think that in the black community, that trauma has been normalized. And so even utilizing yes. the word trauma, yes. we don't even know that we have trauma. If I were to yes. go to a particular place and say, what kind of trauma? They're like, what are you talking about? Right. I remember as a child, because you said you want us to give real answers. Right. I remember as a child going to I grew up in Harlem. Right. Mm -hmm. And I remember going I had my my first black friend that lived in New Jersey. 
and her parents owned a home. And and mm. for me, I was like, wow, right? Well, like, like they're doing well for themselves. I didn't recognize that even that was trauma because yes. my reality was walking past, right? And so I was born in 79, so I grew up in the 80s. So the 80s mm -hmm. in Harlem was, um, right, the crack ep epidemic. Se se there 79, was or 80, 79 or 89, I'm sorry. I was born in 79. I grew up in oh, the 80s. I, I, oh, I, I just thought, okay. It's all right. Go black ahead. don't crack. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank the Lord for my black jeans, my African jeans. We praise you, God. How, can we praise? Hey, God, I bless you. Thank you, Lord right, Jesus. So we just, so we just wanted to make yes. sure <laughs> <laughs> but but like I grew up, I grew up, I, I grew up on the east side, one twenty six between Lexington and Park. Um, yeah, there was a methadone clinic. Yes, right. There was prostitution on Park Avenue. Wow. I would walk up toward West ha Central Harlem, and there were crack vials. Right, there were abandoned lots. There were abandoned the abandoned buildings. There were crumbling infrastructure. That was normal for me. Mm. So when I talk about black persons who live, especially in an urban place, and mm. never mind those who live in a rural space, who are also similar, but oftentimes we don't focus on them, right? Because the majority of us being, especially in the Northeast, being in the urban center, it's normal. Mm. Yes. It becomes normal that, that folks are impoverished. It becomes normal um, that, pe that we live che um, check to check. Uh, it mm -hmm. becomes normal, right? So it's normalized. Um, and now I don't forgot your question, but I started with the beginning. No, no, um, no, 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 you, you on track, go get you on track. No, but that, and so for me, that's why when I talk about the fake, because we need to, we need to own it. Right. And so, and so all of us on here, we have a, a certain degree of education. We work in our particular area. So as you stated, Gary, we're exposed to this. Right. We, we, and some of us, even in our training, we realize, oh my goodness, I need therapy. <laughs> right? And we were, able, <laughs> right? and we were able to say, I need to work on some, because we, we were provided with tools. Yes. We recognize, oh, this ain't normal. Just like when I went to my friend's house in Jersey for the first time. Oh, people li like people live like that. Like, like, like I'm now being exposed to a whole nother way of life. And as, um, uh, 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 Dr. Stoddard said earlier in the work that he does, right, in the patients and, and all of our staff, you're working with individuals that this is their normality. Yes. When you're we're talking about being in Newark and other urban spaces where gun violence is a normality, mm -hmm. going to a school that is failing, it's a normality. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Yes. Going, living in places where there are no resources, it's normal. And so that jumps to what even Leah was talking about, about mm. the internalization. Um, and so I said enough. Oh, man, I, you're going to you're going to make me cry. I, I, I was telling everybody last week that I, there's a guy called the black therapist. And I'm, I think I'm going to be the praying therapist or the crying therapist because you are absolutely positively uh, correct. Leah, I'm going to give you the floor. Um, do our community take mental health seriously? I'm going to take you down, Colette. So I think that that's kind of a loaded question. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because we recognize what's going on within our bodies. Mm -hmm. we, we know what we're feeling and what we're experiencing. I think mm -hmm. that the lack of information has allowed for us not to, to connect the dots as this is a mental health crisis potentially that mm. we're experiencing. Um, mm. In addition to that, we know that with trauma, avoidance mm. is one of the larger symptoms, right? Yes. Yes. And so mm -hmm. m many of us, I would say, have experienced complex level trauma when you, you look at the ACEs study that's out, right? And there's like these 10 areas that they are addressing. And, and you know, you're looking at um, the familial home and some of the experiences, right? Um, DV, alcohol, wh whatever it may be. Like we all have dealt with a measure of trauma. But again, due to the lack of information, 
we don't know how to stick a pin in that thing and say, this is what is literally going on. And once we do, right, Mm -hmm. our, the measure of resilience that we've had as a people has come through our knowledge of God, Mm -hmm. right? Our spirituality. And so once we begin to identify like, hey, I may be dealing with a mental health crisis, then instead of us going to the professional, what we do is we go to the pastor. And that's mm-hmm. not against right, pastor. No, 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 no. Let, let, let me pull them up here so we yeah. see your face. And let me pull them up here to make sure that no, we, we're not hating on you. But yeah, we're we not hating. But, but, and, and, and I must put this out here, Pastor Stoddard. I appreciate you for bringing up Bessel van der Kolk's book, right? The Body yeah. Keeps the Score. Yes. Because it is foundational in understanding what is really happening within the body and with what's happening within the mind, right? Looking yes. at the freezing is what you were speaking of. Yes. Which is a traumatic response to, right, this stimuli that's ongoing. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing. I tell people all the time, it's okay to pay and pray. Right. It is, right? You can go to church. You can speak with your pastor, but then there are practical things that a professional is able to render that will assist you in your healing journey that you will not get. Mm. And don't get me wrong. God is all powerful, true, but he allows us to know that there are some things that we can do as well to aid in our healing journey. And I believe that if we stop avoiding our trauma, more of us will engage in the mental health um, journey, right? Towards our healing so that we can reduce some of the symptoms that we are experiencing. Thank you. Uh, Pastor, I'm gonna let you (laughs) add on to that. And then I know there is something in your arsenal that you use the power of words. Yes. And yeah. why don't you take the handoff from Leah and put that with the power of words? And uh, <laughs> Leah, I'm gonna let you sit back, have the pastor come in, and then uh, Dr. Uh, Colette, you hold on for a second, and then you're gonna piggyback on him. Thank you, my producer's doing his thing in the background. And uh, no, uh, Stoddard is coming up. Uh, so. I'll tell you this. So. Uh, there's there's a book that. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Doc. Thank you uh, for <laughs> for talking about what we do as pastors. <laughs> I appreciate that. And, and truth be told, a lot of people come to church, and instead of going to the therapist, they shout their troubles out. Yeah, that's a that's a whole part of the black church experience. True. Is that True. is that we we shout our trouble, we dance our troubles away. And the truth of the matter is that many of us do need to go and sit down and talk to the therapist. Fortunately for me in my church, I have several licensed clinical therapists who I send members to. I also have a chaplain on staff, and we do a whole program for grief share for people who are dealing with grief. And especially- Stop right there. Stop right there. Stop right there. Yes, sir. Stop right there. Praise God for grief. Yeah. Because- uh, Leah, you know how I feel about this. Now, Dr. Barrow's my new friend right now, so she's going to be down with us or what have you. Uh, my brothers are pastors. I got friends that are pastors. And the inequity between funerals and grief counseling is appalling. So I'm just glad that you uh, dropped that on our spirit. You may yes, go, sir. my brother. I just, needed, I just needed to put that little commercial break <laughs> right there. Well, you, you know I can go with my flow, as the brothers right. would say. So right. it's good to interrupt me every now and then, cut me off and <laughs> do whatever well, you need to do. I'll follow your lead. <laughs> okay. No but but that's the reality that we deal with. We have grief share as a ministry in our church because so many families are grieving. And when you talk about somebody's child getting shot 12 times, mm. how does a mother handle that by herself without some kind of support system? And so... We've set that up in our church, and we have one of our uh, unstaffed chaplain that runs that program for us. Mm -hmm. Uh, But but I've come to understand that having uh, 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 members go to counseling is critical. And usually, because of the relationship members have with their pastor, the pastor is the first line of defense. They'll come to the pastor 
We as pastors then must know when to pass the baton, when mm -hmm. to pass it to the next level, when it's more than what you are capable of handling. Even mm -hmm. if as a pastor, you are clinically trained, there are mm -hmm. times when the relationship that you have with the member is so close that you need to get them to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and I've come to terms with that reality as a pastor. But mm -hmm. there, there's a book that I use, and, and I preach from this book. Um, it's written by Andrew Newberg and Robert Weldman. Uh, the book is essentially Words Can Change Your Brain. Mm -hmm. And this is a powerful book that, that deals with how words literally alter neuron activity in the brain. So... Mm -hmm. In my work with my members, in my work with uh, with uh, with uh, uh, at the hospital with my clients, one of the things I try to do is I this business of speaking life over them, of being able to use words like grace, love, mercy, God values you. Uh, Newberg and Wellman, their research shows that brain activity is tremendously altered by holding a word in your brain and, mm. and almost like meditating on that word. Mm. So, okay. so, so it's amazing to me. And here's something that I'm gonna say that, that will probably blow you away. There are many people that I talk to in Newark who don't go to therapy, who don't go to church, but they listen to Joel Osteen every week. <laughs> it's amazing. And, yeah. and, and, and the thing, the thing that draws them to Joel Olstein is the words that he uses. The mm. words that he uses that seemingly speak peace to them. Mm. And I'm not advocating Joel Olstein. I'm not saying people that's the solution. I'm just speaking of the reality of people being drawn to him, drawn to him in the inner city. People in the hood who are drawn to him because of words that he speaks. And mm. the words that he speaks to them uh, infects and affects them in a positive way. Mm -hmm. And so okay. this business of, of being able to, to speak words of life, words of power, mm. and have people meditate on those words will, will according to Weldman and Newberg, have transformational impact on people's lives. The converse is true, by the way. Negative words also alter people's minds. And right, okay, it's right there. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Let me bring in Dr. Stephanie James because so she'll, she'll talk, talk about, about historic, historic trauma. Yes, and, okay, we got that echo again, but I'm gonna let her speak on historic trauma and those negative words. And then Leah, talk then i'm gonna follow up with the historic journey where that is a uh, concern and doc i'm gonna swing back around to you uh barrow so you can follow along and because you kicked this off with what we see in harlem so uh i'm gonna bring up stephanie james dr stephanie james uh thank you for coming back but uh when uh dr stoddard talked about the negative words i wanted to leave that into the historic trauma so i'm not exactly sure what's going on with the is the echo still there? Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, we've been working diligently behind the scenes. So let me just say this. I think the reality that we need to be able to deal with, uh, even before we can have a conversation about where we are currently, is to really be able to look at the legacies of what enslavement did to us as a people. Because the reality of our being able to even... Um, live in this particular space and why i started off with the conversation about saying how it's been erasure and invisibility is because of the realities that we have never dealt with those residual traumas where they rest in our bodies i love dr stoddard's book about your mind keeps the score uh, there's a one there's another book called grandma's hands and then of course i'm going to reference um one that i think was is very apropos to this conversation and a lot of people, when she originally came up with these research about 12 years ago, they all kind of, uh, you know, assumed that, you know, this was some quack science or they weren't really appreciating it. But it was Dr. Dr. Joy Degree's conversation about post-traumatic slave syndrome. Mm -hmm. and, and about 12 years ago, she did 
um, about, I think about 10 years of both qualitative and quantitative research on the residuals of um, generational trauma and the reality of African Americans' um, adaptive behaviors out of it, but also the mental trauma that is passed down and then um, the realities of how we are, it is being compounded by those entities still being present with us today. Um, I don't know if any of us, when we, because we don't talk about history, and especially history of the African American experiences under enslavement, we don't talk about it as a lived experience. We talk about it so often as economic system or, you know, or work history, or, you know, we might talk about the violence, but we don't really deal with and grapple with a lived experience. Because I think we have, as a people, have a cognitive dissonance to being able to even grapple with that, which says that we are really not healed and we really cannot even begin to digest it. Because the conversation that everybody has, no matter when you're discussing any of the violence or the trauma, is immediately, I could have never lived through that. I could have never, there's no way in the world I could have, I mean, and it's, in our, it's, it's our immediate response. And yet to understand that we are descendants of someone that is, because if you're African-American and you've lived through it, it across the diaspora, someone has passed that space down. Even if you were freed, there was its own trauma. So that's all been passed down. The reality of even, you know, uh, transatlantic trade, the reality of the separation, the reality of the cognitive dissonance that you are, your entire cultural being, your cultural center it was being forcibly removed from you systemically, your name, your language, your family structures, sometimes religion, you know, because, you know, even when we begin to talk about the reality of slave ships or where people arrived, you know, we often forget about even what those, the religious practices that were in Africa that where they were forced to do. I cannot imagine being from a culture on the west coast of Africa that was Muslim and arriving here and the only food made available for you to eat is the underbellies of a pig. And you're, and you're forcibly told to eat that. I cannot imagine the residuals, most especially for African-American women, it's something we do not grapple with. And I think, you know, I had a conversation with someone about silence being taught in regards of sexual, um, sexual, you know, um, any kind of, you know, um, abuse or, you know, exploitation. But the reality that we don't talk about for African-American females under any kind of enslavement is, is that it is a given, it is a normative that they will be sexually abused and raped systemically their their wombs were codified and commodified right so they're so the whole idea of their having any ownership of our bodies understanding okay, you what said, that you does said, you said commodified, said commodified, commodified, commodified. commodified. You mean like, you mean like money. money oh god oh god okay okay so if you're if you're, if you're your body is as which which we which god says is our temple is been seen as a means for an economic advancement with no with no punishment at all generationally then it is a given so what do we do how do we begin to take those feelings back why do we have the reactions what what are we taught our daughters about sexual abuse even in in 2022 about the silences that they do about the with you know the the getting through the getting over you know how to you know overcome we we do not we have never been able to rectify that because we've never been allowed to cry about that we've never been able to be able to move into that i cannot only imagine the insanity you know we we look at you know the the when you read the the slave logs and you look at the the, the ship logs from the, the slave ships and you talk about all the people that got thrown overboard and the insurance policies for people that got thrown overboard what we don't talk about is insanity the reality that what what, what should you, you know not only the situation for yourself, the lived experience of being, you know, chained at the bottom of a ship, you know, rats, feces, dysentery, no language, all of that darkness, no yes, yes. systematic rape, heat. But I can't imagine whether or not a person that I'm chained to, to the left or the right, dies. And I'm left next to a body for weeks. For weeks. weeks. So let me the start trauma there. on that, and you I see up, I see Dr. Collette because I know that that's what we don't do. Those are the things that that the, the body keeps a record. Yes, the body yes. keeps a record. Body I, keeps I, a record. I, you said so. I'm glad. I'm that, glad that 
you were able, you were to, talk able to talk about that. About that. I'm trying not I'm trying to be not... emotional. I'm trying to be, but you're talking, speaking the truth. Look like we lost somebody here. But uh, Leah, I'm going to come to you about the healing journey. Uh, you talk about that. What Dr. Collette, I mean, not, what Dr. Um, Harris has talked about is very true. We go to church 52 weeks of the year. We don't hear that. And we have buried that. And we hear about the slave ships or what have you. Talk about the healing journey. And uh, Dr. B, you could wrap that whole thing up uh, um, where that is concerned. Well, the healing journey, I often say to individuals, it's not an easy one at all, right? It is having to look at the pain, acknowledge the pain that it exists again and stop the avoidance of what has happened. Honor your truth, right? And right. so as you go on the healing journey, you are going to encounter um, some past memories that you've had to experience um, and you will experience it all over again as if it is happening right now. It's safer to do that in space with a trained clinician than to have these right experiences, these flashbacks, right, to, to transpire on your own because it will take you right back to the time that the bad thing that happened to you, because really that's all trauma is is a bad thing that has happened to you in your life that no resolution has taken place in allowing you to desensitize those experiences. The memories will always be there, right? The mind, I tell people, is the baddest computer on the face of this earth. It does not, right, erase. It helps, right, to to reshape and reconstruct the experience where it becomes more palatable for one to actually live with, allow for it, right, to be. And so going along with the healing journey, we know that our story is the power, right, to that. So after learning how to deal with the physiological responses in the body, learning uh, the pastor, I loved it, he talked about, right? The shouting and the running around the church and the praise and the hand clap. We know that bicameral movement, meaning both sides of the brain becoming active, helps to unlock the emotional or the traumatized brain. So after all of that, being able to disclose and to share your story is the power in healing from your traumatic past. So I'll end it there. I know that we're kind of getting along in time. But again, um, having someone that can walk the journey, that healing journey along with you is going to be the most powerful thing because now you have someone else that can hold it because it gets really heavy. We talked about the slave trade, right? We talked about all of the experiences, the body is recording it at a cellular level. You're getting some of the stuff in your wow. body, yours, that's from generations before you, and you don't even recognize where it even came from. And all it takes is for another experience to trigger inside of the body, and you have this huge explosion of reaction. So when you can have someone walk that journey with you and you can share your story in a safe way, then healing can begin. Mm. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for popping back on, uh, Reverend Green. Uh, you want to have uh, Sister ba Dr. Barrow just kind of wrap that part up and you take the end to this of the healing journey. Is that okay with you? Oh, absolutely. Please. Okay. Uh, so good. Thank you so much, um, Leah, for what you just shared. And I definitely appreciate um, Dr. Harris. Love her so much. And how she brings a historical perspective into it. I mean, in all of us, right, hearing about just the journey um, to the Americas, wherever we landed, um, and and the heaviness. And, and all of us, we still experience that today, the heaviness of that. Whether you watch a movie or you read a book, right, it's Black History Month, and so many channels retell those stories. And some, some of us, some of our friends won't even watch those kind of things because they testify that after they watch those uh, movies, there's a heaviness 
that they experience. But it's not just then, it's also continues today. And not just from the story, right? As me, as a little girl, um, this week I was um, on my way home and I was driving through Milburn and I ended up on Wyoming Avenue. And Wyoming Avenue, I don't know if you ever drove through that in Milburn, but beautiful houses, right? Uh, Multi-million dollar homes. It leads out onto South Orange Avenue. And as you keep going down journeying, you end up into Newark and you end up into a hard area in Newark. And I began thinking about, as Dr. Harris said, the lived experience of an individual that is only four miles (laughs) from millionaires, (laughs) four miles from millionaires, but yet your community has, I mean, do we think about that? Your community has crumbling infrastructure, but four miles away (laughs) is wealth. What is the psychological impact of that? What, what, what is, I mean, I I came out and then I was driving through Newark. I think it was, yeah, I work in Newark, but I was driving through a different area because I was trying to get to the bank and um, I was passing a school and right across from that school, I'm not, I'm not kidding you. This is the Fairmont section of Newark, abandoned house after abandoned house, boarded up house. And I said, what is the psychological impact of a little child going to school and coming out to that? Every Like, do we think about that lived experience? Here is how I want to wrap this up. It's not a bad thing that people go to church to express this. Mm-hmm. It's not a bad thing that they go to their pastor for prayer. It's not a bad thing that they go and say, I need counseling or they're shouting or they're screaming or they're crying because why they're getting it out. Even as Leah said, said, and a matter of fact, in scripture, right? I, I was looking at this earlier where Jesus told this individual whom he cleansed, according to the Mosaic law, he said, go t- show the priest, right? Go present yourself to the priest. And so the priest has always been a center of, of, of the Jewish community. The pastor has always been a center of the, of, of the black community. So let's not, and, and today the imam being a center of the black community. So let's not uh, diminish that. What I will right. say, however, is that the pastor, the minister, the leader must know when they ought to refer out. There is a, you have to know. And, and I think, and, 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 and I think there's a, a part where there are still some traditions that say, you don't need therapy. Just come and pray and I'll pray with right. you and I'll walk you through this thing. Right. But right. just like, and I want to end with this, just like the pastor prays with you and you go do that surgery because the pastor has not been trained to remove right. that growth. Right. <laughs> the pa- pastor has not been trained to do any of that kind of therapy that your body needs in the physical. Likewise, mm. unless that person has been trained in school in that particular art, they don't know the various tools and the methodologies and the mo- modalities that therapists have been trained in. Mm-hmm. And just like God has gifted people to preach and teach on a Saturday or Sunday morning. God has also gifted people to sit in a room with someone and walk them through that journey of healing. God has gifted individuals like Gary. He has filled them with his, and I'm a preacher now, so I feel like preaching in a moment. He has gifted people with his Holy Spirit who have the gift of discerning, who can speak a word of knowledge and use the tools that the, the academics and their training and their internship have provided them. How is that any less? Yeah. Right. 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 Then your sermon. How is that any less than you laying on of hands? Come on. How is that any different? And so, and so we, the church come to the church. Come listen. Sometimes I need a shot. Matter of fact, I'll probably need a shot right now. Sometimes I need that to get that out. Sometimes I need to abandon myself in worship. don't, Don't ever stop that. But there are right. there are things that we have lived with that we have carried on ourselves, the weights of our everyday experiences, the weight of the poverty, the weights of the struggling, the weight of all of that that is on us. Now we need to go the next step. Yes. So that I yes. can be free from the internal impact <sighs> that is weighing on me as every day. I leave a place of poverty poverty, and I pass through a place that of millionaires. And I'm like, wait, these are my neighbors. What happened to my community? 
Mm. Thank you. Uh, I well, hey, can I speak freely, Reverend Green? Like we're like we're friends in the Absolute, dorm. Absolutely, e Edwards Hall. Yeah, like I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna play it like this. Like, uh, can you meet me in the cafeteria, Doctor Barrow, so we can talk <laughs> later? Because because uh, listen, I'm overwhelmed. Amen. And when you and I, when when you and I talk, and we talked about this back there, um, uh, you know, you told me about Dr. Harris. Um, we talked about Dr. Stoddard, and you know, we, we, you know, you and I just talking. We were talking back and forth. You know, we woke up early this morning, went over our notes. Yep. To yep. make sure that, that 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 this is. But I, I got to tell you, um, even uh, and I'm going to be very transparent. Uh, we've had some technical difficulties, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, James Harris said that we had something to say today, and the devil That's right. is, a, is a liar. Yeah, yes, yes. And um, I, I'm overwhelmed positively the amount of books Dr. Stoddard has brought out, and then to hear Dr. Harris like, yeah, I read that book too. And Dr. Barrow's like, yeah, I read that book too. And then uh, Leah's like, I read that too. And, uh, you know, Leah's in Florida, out of her home office, and is still here. So, Reverend Green, man, I, I um, this is more than um, friendship, and um, this is a mission now. This, this is definitely a mission. Um, I need you to chime in. Uh, I know you're not prepared, but, you know, right now, even though we're friends, I, I, I have the upper hand and uh, give you authority to speak on this. What is going on here? What is this happening? All of these experts went beyond their yeah. training yeah. to speak from the heart. And we got that. Now what we're going to do? I'm going to leave that to you right now. Well, well number one, um, I've learned uh, in my imperf imperfection to listen to the, to, to the voice of God. Right. Uh, and so when God spoke to me and said, these are the folks that need to be, including yourself, Gary. Uh, that need to be on this on this webinar. Uh, I was obedient um, and to to his to his voice. Number two, um, we we are going to continue this. Uh, num number three, uh, we we uh, everyone was talking about healing. Yeah. Um, you you can't heal unless you really know what's going on mm -hmm. and the generational trauma that in the generational mental health issues mm -hmm. that that exist in our community and in fact in all communities yeah yeah in two hours um there's a book celia the slave that was required for my students at wau mm -hmm. um and dr stephanie james knows um knows if you want to bring her back up uh okay. she knows about uh she knows about this book um talks about, talks about Celia. Celia. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, There's a legal um, case. Was, 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 was a legal case. A legal case. And, um, and um, I'm going to give that feedback again. No, uh, we'll bring her up to. Uh, we'll, we'll bring, bring her, her up yeah, to. Uh, yeah, okay. okay. And, and it talk, it, it's basically about a woman um, who was bought master. Uh, and most, most of the time, we think that um, slaves were were there to pick cotton and mm -hmm. to uh, fulfill the economic needs mm -hmm. of the of the slave master or the or the landowner. But mm -hmm. Celia was bought to be his sexual slave. Really, that's what her role. Was. Yes, her role. He was a widow, and he bought Celia to be. Uh, his his uh, illegal wife, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, so, you 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 nice way of putting it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. nice way of putting and, it. Right. And 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 she had no she had no rights. And so when we when we when we talk about the relationship between Celia and her master, she had no rights. That this was this was me too before me too, mm -hmm. right? This was me too <laughs> before me too, and. Uh, Celia got tired of it and fell in love with a with a fellow slave, 
Oh. I'm talking about generational trauma and, and trauma amongst relationships between black women and black men. Mm -hmm. um, and she fell in love with a, a, a fellow slave and the, and the slave fell in love with her. Yet the master would come um, and expect her. Um, what was he going to do? He was a slave. Right. He had no rights. He was cattle. Imagine, imagine that social construct mm -hmm. and think about what happens today. Mm -hmm. um, ended up, read the book. I, I won't tell you. I won't tell you all. <laughs> You're going to challenge me like we were in school? Read, read, right. Yeah, you like used to be in school that, Gary, go ahead and read the book. And we'll, and, we'll, and we'll discuss at the end of the semester. That's right. Me, that's right. But we talk about generational trauma. And I'll just leave you a reference to the healing part that Leah talked about. Um, you you can't heal. I see my I see my cousin Francis Garnett um, on the line. I'm so glad to see cousin Francis. She's she's one of my favorite cousins. Uh, my first cousin, by the way. I, I had to give her a shout out. But you can't heal. You can't heal unless you talk. You 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 can't. We got it in our family. Yeah. Stop hiding stuff, right? You're gonna, you're gonna make you, me you, curse. You're gonna you, make me you curse. Can, and my mother's on this cannot, line. Right. You cannot. You can't. My father, as great as he was, did not talk to me about the pain that he had when he lost his father at 15. My grandfather was born in, and um, cousin Francis's grandfather was born in 1896. Hmm. So that meant that his father or mother's probably a slave. So they went through what they went through in this country. Mm -hmm. And and my father had this inner strength that he got because he had to get it. But one of the things is that he never talked about his pain of losing his father at 15. He never talked about it. And I know it was painful for him. In order for us to get through our trauma and not pass it along to the next generations, A, we have to admit it. And then we have to address it. We have to get help for it. And then we have to communicate and talk about it. Admit it and spit it. <laughs> Look, I'm going to uh, go and do this. Phil, why don't you do this? We're going to go around the horn. Let's bring up. Uh... By the way, Gary, this is, this is part one. For part one. I think this is no, this is no part one. This is ongoing. You know, you, you know, on Zoom, they said this is a reoccurring. Yes, thing. this is yes. reoccurring. Yes. So this is how we're gonna do it. because of the feedback, um, and you know how much I love baseball, and we're gonna have Dr. Uh, Harris lead off with her final words. Okay, if that's okay with you, and then we're gonna go to yes. then we're gonna go to Leah with her final words. Then we're going to go to uh, Dr. Uh, um, Colette with her final words. And we're going to ask uh, Dr. Um, Stoddard to say his final words. And uh, with your permission, we could close on that. Uh, let me just say this, because I know I could say this at the back end. Um, Derek, we've done a lot of things together. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a gap that we, didn't, we haven't even really worked together. And God has brought us mm -hmm. together in 22 and um, I'm a little emotional because um, I don't want to take out anything. I know Leah for a long time, but, and you told me about Dr. Harris, but you know, when Dr. Harris talked about babies being commodities, yeah. being commodities, that brought us back yes. to our history class yeah. where we first met. Yes. And uh, yes. I, our professor will be proud to know what we're yes. doing uh, right now. So, yes. Um, Phil, I'm going to ask you to do your miracles. Let me first thanks. I, nobody knows Dr. H um, Harris. Thank you for hanging in there. She's a real, as we say, baller. She had was going behind the scenes, but we're going to lead off with her. And then after she's finished, we're going to do like a relay. And then me and you're going to come back on the backside and wrap this pony up. Is that okay with you, brother? That's great, brother. Thank you. Okay. Let's do it, Phil. I'm here. Um, I just want to piggyback on what um, Reverend Green just said about talking and about how we have to be able to deal. 
And I will say that be, um, because there's a couple things that I think I, we need to talk about in regards of even these conversations about critical race theory and about what these school boards are doing. And I have to bring this home in regards to educational policy. The reality that African-American peoples in this nation have been left with so many residuals also meant that I think some of our creativity, the artifacts of how we have decided to be able to let it out because we could not talk about it directly, have come in our arts and our culture and our literature and our ability to breathe life into it and, in, and, and put our emotional reactions and our emotional needs into our expressions, those artifacts that we hold so dear. We understand the blues, we understand jazz, we understand gospel and spirituals and paintings and our written word because those were the ways in which we attempted in a spaces of silence. And going back to what Dr. Collette said, talking about even driving through a neighborhood that shifts quickly in regards to social economic. Well, I can only imagine what it's like to live in a shack with no heat, no clothes, you know, out in the in behind million dollar mansions where you know that I'm working from can't see to can't see and everything I have is is going to this these this home and to support this level of wealth and I have nothing. A part of the adaptive behavior on even plantations is about the silence. It's about the reality that you cannot speak the adaptive behaviors that we taught Quickly, I will share that when I first birthed my oldest son and I recognized that I, only by the space and the distance of the grace of God and 150 years was the fact that I would be able to raise them without anybody at any time period um, being able to take them out of my hand. I mean, we understand the reality of the reflex of adrenaline for fight or flight. I cannot imagine living my entire life that way under the threat of violence without perfection or someone else's whims or the whims or the financial burdens of someone else that my children could be sold, my husband, I could be moved. I don't know what that's like living under that, that adrenaline that consistently does. We know what it does to ourselves with physicality. But in regards of educational policy, I will return and circle back to this question or this conversation because of the way in which we have been able to speak. Because I do believe African Americans in this country and across the diaspora have spoken. It has not been verbally because we've kept our, we, what we have not been able to in our cognitive dissonances to verbalize, we have expressed. Oftentimes, those expressions are filled with things that are making others that don't want to deal with those things uncomfortable. And the banning of books and like things right now to me are, are the way in which I am seeing the conversations and our repression being redone. This whole conversation about, um, you know, critical race theory as being a buzzword when it's not real, right? Because it is simply a theoretic framework for being able to analyze phenomenon or analyze, you know, systemic racism, or analyze legal tenant, or analyze education, or analyze housing, or analyze whatever. That's all it is. There is no, you know, it is not a big, bad wolf somewhere. But even in that conversation, when they're using it as a buzzword and we begin to talk about how it is making certain students uncomfortable, what it actually says to me is, is that they are grappling. That we're finding that the students that don't want to deal or the parents that don't want to deal or the ones that are going to these school boards are having all these things repressed. Do not want to deal with having to read, analyze, study, understand the lived experiences and what it does. And because it is moving on them emotionally, they're having them banned. Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye is now under attack. And if we don't understand, if nobody's ever read the book, it is a psychological book that actually talks about the effects of beauty and aesthetics and lived culture and the, the onset of television and the idea of books and, and, and data that are telling this little black, beautiful girl. Bacola Breedlove was one of my favorite books as a child that she was beautiful and that she had to grapple with whether or not she fit into the paradigm of America's aesthetic. It talks about the reality of her lived experience as opposed to the children on the other side or the children that were residing in her Dick and Jane books and everything else. And she wanted to have blue eyes because she wanted, she wanted, she wanted so badly to be accepted. 
like Miss Dr. Green talked about, Reverend Green talked about with Instagram and Facebook and what it's doing to our kids. That is the subject matter of the blue aside. And because it is something that others don't want to have to grapple with, what the effects of this culture has done to our children, what they feel like, how it has affected their psycho psychology, they're banning it. We can't allow that to happen. We can't allow even the residuals of how people have passed down those things that they were trying to communicate that we need to heal, we need to read, we need to be able to understand, to know even why we've adapted the way we have. We can't let it be disappear. disappear. Can't. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris. I appreciate you so much. Um, I'm just going to step in a little here. I know that uh, Dr. Stoddard has a service. So Dr. Barrow and Leah, if you would allow uh, Dr. Stoddard to make his closing statements. So I know he has a, a service in a couple of minutes, if that's okay with you. Dr. Stoddard, your final words, my brother. It was a pleasure to see you again. And I hope you and I can connect in the future. Dr. Harris, powerful words. You are going to hear from me. That I'm just going to tell you right now, me and you are going to... Uh, uh, Reverend Green should have never introduced me to you. So uh, we, we're going to, uh, I, I just loved it. And if you could put all the books in the chat that we talked about today, we can follow up in. So uh, Dr. Stoddard, your final words, my brother. I'm dying to hear what you have to say. It's, it's, it's a shut up and dribble move. It's basically saying, just shut up and dribble. We don't want to hear your story. We don't want to deal with the, the, the issues of your pain and the residual effects of what was done to you. Just shut up and dribble. And it's a terrible state of affairs that we're in where we have no desire, where our, 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 our brothers and, and our cousins have no desire to deal with the reality of what enslavement has done to a people. But I will say this, and, and we walk a unique spot here. Um, by that I mean, on the one hand, we cannot forget our history. We cannot forget what we have been through. On the other hand, it is clear that we are a resilient people. That's why we are still here. That's why we have accomplished what we have accomplished in spite of. That's why we have made the progress that we have made in spite of being pushed down, marginalized, disenfranchised. In spite of all of that, we still rise. And that's a, uh, that's a sign of a people who refuse to give up, who refuse to quit, who refuse to allow ourselves to be limited by the barriers that have been placed above us and around us. We have broken through those barriers in spite of. And so uh, I want to leave us with, with, the, with, with this. As, as we think about the other side of it, the one side of it is the negative, the, the awful experiences. The other side of it is our resilience. How do we continually build resilience? That's where I want to focus as I wrap this thing up. How do we build our resilience? And, and uh, according to uh, the authors that I referenced earlier, uh, Words Can Change Your Brain, Newberg and Wallman, uh, they said, by holding a positive, optimistic word in your mind, you stimulate frontal lobe activity. This area includes specific language centers that connect directly to the motor cortex, responsible for moving you into action. And as our research has shown, the longer you concentrate on positive words, the more you begin to affect other areas of your brain. This is what I want to get to. Cortisol is a stress hormone that floods your body with energy. It is meant to help you if you are in danger. But if constant stress keeps is in your body, it keeps the cortisol levels high. Constant stress keeps the cortisol level high in your body. And that begins to affect adversely various parts of your brain. Therefore, what should you do? The antidote 
to manage the cortisol level of your brain, you've got to be intentional to build that resilience, to keep building that resilience. You've got to be intentional. What do we do to address the cortisol levels, to bring them down? You got to learn how to laugh. You got to learn heartily how to laugh. And we learned how to do that. Yes, you got to learn how to laugh. You got to you got to intentionally focus on positive things. Because the negative stuff that has happened to us, if we allow that to flood us over and over and over again, it will absolutely destroy us. Talk about, uh, talk about uh, how uh, our minds will be warped because of the constant stuff. We've got to learn how to refocus our energies, redirect our energies, learn how to laugh, learn how to focus on positive things. Uh, to lower the level of cortisol in our bodies. Learn how to play relaxing music. Learn how to dance. Watch a comedy show. Make a gratitude list. Write down a list of things that we're grateful for. We're talking about lowering the cortisol levels in our bodies. Enjoy your favorite hobby. Plant flowers. Uh, plant some collard greens <laughs> <laughs> and some kale. Yes, Practice sir. Practice making yourself smile. Force yourself to smile. Ladies and gentlemen, repeat words that are going to empower you. I'm powerful. I'm, I'm kind. I'm loving. I'm full of grace. Uh, 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 I'm capable. I'm qualified. We've got to continually rebuild our resilience reserve bank. Thank you. Because life and the negative stuff that we experience is gonna draw against that. And I wanna urge us to make the deposits in our resilience reserve bank so that when the stresses of life draw against that, we will not find ourselves writing bounce emotional checks, but we'll still have enough in the tank to keep pushing through. Thank you so much, Elder Stoddard. And of course, praying, praying, praying. Yes. Praying and singing and going to church. And if you need to, go see a therapist. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Stoddard. We appreciate you. Next up to bat, my dear friend from Michigan. And please give us your final words. Thank you for coming on. We're so excited. And, you know, me and you already done this before we are reoccurring so why don't you drop some knowledge i know everybody if you know everybody was impressed we were happy with t talking about the journey give us your final words leah so i would say we often hear about black lives matter but i want to take it a little further than that black pain matters and the reason that I'm bringing attention to that for the listening audience is, is as we come up in the black community, most times we are taught to avoid our pain, right? Whether overtly done or covertly done, we have been silenced when something affects us emotionally. That is seen by many as a measure of resilience, but it also is having an adverse effect on how we're able to show up strongly as a people and healthy from a mental perspective. And so I, again, want to encourage everyone to finally allow yourselves to be seen. Allow the truth of what resides within to be acknowledged, honored, and recognized, not just solely by others, right? Because we often seek the validation of others, but we don't know how to validate our own selves so that we can show up for others, right? In our family system, within the community, and just the world at large. And so if we begin to acknowledge our own pain, we won't continue the perpetuation of this pain onto right? Subsequent generations. And so our children now will be able to have a stronger foundation than picking up pieces along the way to try to reconnect and figure this thing out. If we begin to do this ourselves, 
honoring the space that we currently reside in, confronting the pain, although it hurts. In the end, you will find that it is a better thing done again for generations to come in the black community than what we are doing today. So Gary, that would be my final words. I, 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 you know, I have a problem with you. Not, I know you're a great therapist. You have to go out there and speak. I know Miss uh, um, Sybil Finney, uh, Reverend Green was telling me Sybil Finney is a great speaker. Now you heard Dr. Stephanie James hooping. And, you know, we're going to uh, close out with uh, Dr. Collette. I'm already excited. But, Leah, you always bring a Black Pain Matters. I'm about to license that joint. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be taking that from me, dear. Hey, listen. Watch out for Reverend Green. He going to take that before you because, you know, he got the resources. So, you know, we need to call our lawyers now. Black pain matters. That's true. Yeah. 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 You know how much I love you. I'm glad that we connected in 2022. And uh, thank you for coming on and let us know. Uh, I'm going to walk away. I'm going to walk away with what... Uh, the books that Dr. Um, Stoddard talked about, uh, Dr. Stephanie uh, talked about with the uh, the whole um, commoditizing, commodity of the babies, and now Black Pain Matters. I am afraid to hear what Dr. Brown has to say. So, you know, because I see her in the background writing notes. She coming strong. So, you know, so if you want to, if you haven't bring your hearts to Jesus in mental health yet, and have church. She's going to close us out. Leah, it's good to see you. Uh, too, I, I, I say this with all truth, man. I love you. Glad to see everything is going well. Please give your husband, and I'm sure Derek will extend the same thing too when he says, um, give everybody my love and enjoy your weekend. And thank you for coming on, taking your time coming on. Thank you, Gary. All right. Uh, so right now, we're going to have uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Colette Barrow. Uh, do I need to say anything? Do I need to introduce you like this is church? You're going to close us no, out? No. <laughs> I think we're going to have a closing. I don't know if we're going to get that song. I hope we do. But, but, um, there's nobody but, on this panel I know that plays. So No. Uh, you know, so I don't I'm play. Gonna, no, no. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to stay in my lane and I'll say this. I I'm have thoroughly, mm -hmm. thoroughly enjoyed this time. I only have two questions for yourself as well as for Leah. Are either one of you licensed to provide services in New Jersey? Because uh, there are some folks on here that, that need some therapy. That answer is yes. And we always here to negotiate because uh, let me pull Leah up real quick because people really need to know this. So on some insurances, I get reciprocity. And um, so ever since the pandemic, we've been able to go over uh, state lines to um, speak. So I'm going to say the answer is yes. Call us okay. because people don't call anyway. And if we don't have the answer, uh, we'd be able to point you in the right direction. Uh, did I say that right, Leo? I, I think that's the right answer. Yes, yes. Definitely reach out um, and then we can talk about because there's various ways of being able to provide what is necessary for one to heal. Um, so, yes, if, if anyone is in the listening audience, I know that they have brought up my information um, earlier on in the show, but I will also provide my business number. Please give me a call. Give Gary a call and we will see how best we can assist and accommodate you in your healing journey. My number is 734-480-8065. Again, that's 734 734- 480-8065. I would love to go along the journey with you. Okay. Thank you for that, Leah. And thank you for answering that question. And um, yeah. a lot of people don't know, I'm on psychology today. If you go on psychology today and look up uh, Gary Graham, or I'm going to even say this, I'm proud to say this. If you Google black therapist in Harlem, my SEO is right up there on the top. So, uh, yeah. So I'm going to uh, give you this space and uh, me and Reverend Green will uh, catch you on the other side. And thank you for coming. It was a thank pleasure you. meeting you. Um, just like I said to Dr. Stephanie, 
um, I'm going to take this personal time to looking forward for us to working together in 2022. There's a lot certainly. of platforms there. Okay. Certainly. Um, it's certainly been um, an honor and a privilege just to come on this morning. I've enjoyed myself. I've gleaned much from this time. What I want to leave with the listening audience is this. It's high time that we normalize therapy, that we take it from being a taboo subject, and that when people say, I need help, that we give them the resources that they need. And so that's why I asked the question as to, can they provide services where we are, right? And so we've heard that they can provide services across state line. And, and many times, people don't know how to access the help that they need um, in my professional role as executive director of community and population health at University Hospital, we recognize, I, I, in population health, this has always been the case, but the pandemic has even um, magnified this truth, and that is the role of the faith-based community. And by that, this is what I mean. Even in I Am, right, we initiated um, houses of worship providing COVID testing. Because an I am interfaith action movement who's hosting this today, we recognize that people trust their house of worship when uh, testing and then vaccination, right? People had questions and churches became forums at where they could get answers. Um, the pastor was educated as to what to respond to people, how to share and how to encourage them to get vaccinated. And so we've seen the role that the faith based leader provides in this. Likewise, when it comes to therapy, the church, the mosque, we ought to normalize therapy and make it okay. I had someone tell me recently who suffered great loss in 2021 that her pastor said, you don't need therapy. Come to me and I will counsel you. Mm -hmm. Now I get the counsel. But unless you've been licensed in that area, unless you've been trained in that area, there's some added resources yes. that the individual needs. And mm -hmm. so today, uh, Gary was saying, you know, if you ain't come to Jesus yet, come to him. So I'm going to throw that out there. You need to come to Jesus. Give your life to Jesus. But besides that, right, know this. Jesus, there, was, there was a time where Jesus spoke and mm. the person was healed. Mm. There were other instances where Jesus touched and the person was healed. And then there's this crazy story in the Bible where Jesus spat on the person and they were healed. Another instance where he took mud and he mixed the dirt and he put it on them and they were healed. The result was healing. Does it matter that you got healing through therapy versus going to the altar? Does it make you more spiritual? Because someone laid hands on you and you fell out in the spirit and came away changed. Is it the, is that the is it the method, the modality, or is it the result? Jesus. And so my prayer today is that we would be a people who would no longer live in secret, no longer suffer in silence, but that we would get the help we need. We know we need help because we feel the stress in our bodies. We've been talking about it all morning. We know we need help because we feel the stress in our minds. We know we need help when uh, the way we view things is impacted and it's impacting our lives. Listen, get the help you need. Don't allow shame nor stigma mm. to stop you any longer. Don't allow any of that. And so parents tell the truth. Yes. Um, I, I want to end with this story and she ain't listening. So I won't, I won't get in trouble. Do you know, it wasn't until I was an adult that I learned that my mother first came to the Americas, but she came to Canada. And once she came to Canada, that the person who was supposed to receive her never showed up. Mm. I never knew that story that she came into a country, knew nobody. Mm. and had to meet a family and became a domestic worker taking yes. care. I never knew that story, taking care of their children. I never knew that she showed up in a foreign land mm. and knew nothing. What are the stories? That's trauma. 
What are the stories that we possess that we possess in our lives? But because we keep it a secret, we're silent. We don't share that we hurt. We don't, we tell our people you you don't need to cry. We pat them on the back. Be quiet. It's okay. It's okay. Mm. Let's normalize getting help. Yeah, I'm done. God bless you all. I, Thank I, you so I, much. I, I'm all right. I I'm goodbye. Uh, I'm, 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 as we said, I'm gonna hit you up in the cafeteria. Okay. <laughs> See you there after at the class. After class, <laughs> exactly. Uh, Green, listen, yes. man. Yes. Can I speak honest? Can I get yes, the authority to speak honest? Yes, sir. This is unexpected. Um, what is happening? Yeah. I've seen the numbers jump or whatever. We don't. Like my man Puffy said, we don't need to stop. I'm speechless. Um, mm. I, I see Dr. Finney. I'm just going to take a long shot here. I see Dr. Sybil Finney fooling around behind yeah. the scenes here. If she pops Good. up, maybe Good. she can pray us out. But yeah, yeah. What, what, I will what, what final words you got to say? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm really speechless. And you know I'm a man of what? I'll say this. There was a time I was a gospel promoter, and you knew this. Right. Yes. Now I can, f and I used to take gospel talent and bring yes. them to an arena or a church. Yes. And yes. you were there in my early days in my twenties, and we were bringing right. the whinings, all yep. of these people together. Yep. Yep. And this is no different than that. You know. That's right. That's when right. I heard, when I hear, uh, uh, you know, the commodity. That's one that we got right. Black pain. Yes. We got yes. uh, uh, no shame. A lot of our families are came domesticated from another country, and the shame, and sent us to school, working two jobs or what have you. Yes, have you. yes. I talked to you about my dad coming from another country and how other races tried to split us apart. And me and yes. you had a whole conversation about that. Then I told yes. you about how Major League Baseball is systematically taking out the African-American baseball player. Yes, yes. We've talked about all of that. And we have so and every other race or religion talks about their pain, grasp onto it, and it, get, and it, and it launches them to another level. But we're the only ones that's been taught to be silent. That's what I got out of here. Yes. And I'm, and I'm going to tell you, my brother, whether we do something together or not, I'm not done. That's right. I am. I am not done, brother. I am not done. I want to thank you for bringing this forum together. I I can't tell you how much I love you, and um, thank you for uh, doing this. And uh, and I met two more friends today, and uh, Dr. Colette and uh, Dr. Harris. I'm as I said, um, I'm following up, and you know I will, and I appreciate it. Yes. Your words, your your floor, man. Thank Go ahead, you got it. Thank thank you, Gary. And thank you for what you did today um, and your professionalism, um, your knowledge and expertise. You have always had a gift um, ever since Oakwood. You've always had a gift and God has blessed you tremendously in the space of public health and mental health. Uh, I'll also say that um, we, we must we must keep this going. Um, one of the thing that, that one of the things that we talked about today was grieving. Yes. Um, and you brought that point up about grieving. Um, and, and the fact that historically, Dr. Stephanie knows this, you know, we were not allowed to grieve. Yes. And right. so during slavery, we, we were not allowed to grieve. Mm -hmm. And, and um, it, it was see somebody, you, 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 you put them in the ground, and you go back to work. That's mm -hmm. how we sort of got into this, they're in a better place. They're in a better place was is a coping mechanism for us. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a they're in a better place is a our belief system allows us to cope. But mm -hmm. also we need to also learn how to grieve and yes. talk about our pain. Jesus wept. Yes. And if Jesus wept, we showed up can. Yes. And um so so I want to br just bring that point out and then uh and then and then the 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 word I just text my children um, about saying those, uh, Dr. Starter talking about saying, and, and, the, and Leah, uh, the, 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 the healing path, the healing, the road to healing. Mm. We got to get black pain matters. Uh, oh, man. Oh, my Lord. Lord, my Lord. There's so uh, many my, my man. 
Oh, right there. Right there. Right there. Right there. That, there. That, that, that is going to be the next topic. Um, and because, yeah. because I, you know, I, I've been talking about in state government, um, I've been talking about to the governor. I said, we, we got to deal with trauma in the black community. And Governor Murphy said, absolutely. I said, it's compounded. It's generational. It's, it's, it's systemic trauma. It's personal trauma. But, but systemic and means it's planned. It's planned. It's planned. It's when Dr. Collette said, said, what messages and images are we showing our, our young people when they live four miles when the lifestyle of folks that live four miles from them is completely opposite to theirs. And so you heard, you heard, you heard what Dr. Collette said, man. She said, black don't crack. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right. And you know, and you know, Dr. Stoddard talked about the positive words. Yes. What do we do? Yes. Yes. In order yes. to put this face on. Yes, yes. So, like, I called you this morning, and we always talk, Frank, like, got up early this morning. Yeah. Why did I get up extra early this morning? Yeah. Why did I pass the soap over my body an extra time? Yeah. Why did I curl my hair and make sure that I don't look as great? Why yeah. did I brush my teeth extra? Because I knew something special yes. was happening today. Yeah. Why did we look on there and you call me and we called each other yes. an extra time? so we can disintegrate mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. trauma that we've had mm -hmm. for years. And, and you know, you know in, in I am an in interfaith action movement, Gary. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a safe space. And I just, I love all of the members that know that. You know Reverend Green loves you and nothing you can do about it. Um, because we've become a community. Mm. virtual community. Some I am members have never personally met each other. Mm -hmm. Right. I believe that. They've I never personally met each other. And, they, and when, they have, when they meet, it's like, oh, that's Dr. Collette. Oh, that's, mm. well, that's uh, Sister Nora Drury. Mm. Here, here is the deal. It's a safe space call. Mm -hmm. We don't judge on that call. Mm -hmm. You come on, you express what's going on in your life, and there's, if, there's, if there's testimony, if there's pain, that we we are a community of of a support system. Mm. We need that, Gary. We 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 don't need more communities that we need communities where people are loved on, mm. where they can express themselves, where they can get help. So we we get your help, right? Yeah. If if Reverend Green is going through something, I need to go talk to somebody. And 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 I listen, you know, you know. Black men, we don't do counseling. We don't do counseling. You know what they call me? You said. And, 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 uh, and, and Dr. Collette will tell you, they call me the unicorn. Right. <laughs> <laughs> because there's not many of me, you know, when somebody says to me things like, and I know we got a couple of minutes, but we, you can talk about because me and you've been this before. When somebody takes your job away. Yeah. Now yeah. we work for ourselves now. You know, we right. pay our own insurance. That's right. Somebody, right. So That's when right. somebody, and, and um, you can't get me to work for anybody right. anymore. Right. I learned I learned that for the first quarter century of my life. Yes. But when they take your job away from you, or I, I'll share this story with you, just like uh, Dr. Collette. One day I went to work, um, and I, I, I'll sub say this, that I used to be so afraid of getting fired. Mm. I used to overcompensate and being great to my staff. Mm. Let me set that up. Mm -hmm. And I got hired. Somebody got hired. I won't say what they are, whatever. Came in third. Uh, I cut my hair, and my boy said to me, "Yo, why you cut your hair?" I said, "I'm being prepared to be fired because I mm. know what's up." Ten day, two days later, my immediate supervisor walked into my office and walked me out and paraded me in front of my staff mm. of 21 mm. and my patients of 500. Mm. Okay. And what he expected me to do is what Juwan Howard did to that man. And I did not do that. Right. And when I walked out, the, I said to him, the last thing I said to him is, you probably want to reconsider because you're doing the wrong thing. And he kept on doing because this was easy for him to do. This is what he does. I call my attorney the next day, and I'm sitting here. Yes. 
for the next six months when I was looking for my next thing, mm. my soul was torn out. Mm. I had nobody to talk to, you know? Yes. And yes. the point that is black men reach out. You yes. know what I'm saying? I'm, yes. I'm going to say this nicely, whatever. God's got me. I'll speak to you for a half an hour. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I, yeah. I got you. Cause oh, and by the way, I want everybody to know, I've been to counseling. So, no. so well, I, I have, I, I have too. I have been to counseling <laughs> I, I, and, and I will go again. <laughs> I will go again. I, and I, you have to do that. Or I else a, you will do what Juwan Howard did. Right. <laughs> Yo, if we could get Juwan Howard on the show, that's my yeah. dude right there. Yeah. But, but let me um, say this, Gary. Yeah. I want to, I want to, um, Dr. Sybil Finney. Yeah. I want to, I want to, she is the um, one of the premier gospel vocalists and preachers. Yeah, you told me that. In the Church of God in Christ tradition, mm. uh, Reverend Dr. Sybil Finney, um, one of our pillars, and I am our, our, um, our, our minister mm. of music, um, and she's a powerful preacher. And I would like for her, if she... And if she has the ability to sing, uh, you know, I'm, I'm used to I'm used to worshiping on today. So mm -hmm. um, everybody knows that um, if if she could could do a song for us, whatever song you want to do, Dr. Sybil, and and then pray us out as only yeah. you can. I yes, yeah, I, I, I'm looking in the back uh, room here. I see her name. But I don't see her at all. So um, she's see. not. I don't think she's on video. There she is. No, but she's. Well, see, we so. have. She's there. She's there. Yeah. Oh, she. Oh, she's not going to show the video. She's just going to. She's going to sing. She's going to bless us with her voice. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so let me, let me get out the way. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor Doctor Finney, I've never. I know of you. <coughs> Excuse me. I know of you. I've been looking forward to this. Uh, we're going to turn it over to you. And then as soon as you pray, we'll close this out. Thank you so much, Dr. Fitty, for being on with us today. Blessings and respect to all. I've enjoyed every bit of it. May I offer this prayer in song. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace because I need you and you need me. We're all a part of God's body. Stand with me. Agree with me. We're all a part of God's body. It is his will that every spiritual and physical need be supplied. You are important to me. Pastors, I need you to survive. Therapists, you are important to me. I need you to survive. I don't believe he brought us this far. I don't believe he brought you this far. I don't believe he brought me this far to lead me. I need you to serve Yes, Lord. My Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I have to bring up my girl. Listen, B. What? Hallelujah. 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 
Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank I'm you, just gonna, Lord. I'm just going to end the broadcast right here. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good Saturday. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Hallelujah. May his son shine upon you. Yes. May yes, yes. Rest. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah.